I am so glad to see you here. You are our first audience for which we're going to present the new Common Core Standards. We are rolling out the standards to our entire staff in January and really looking forward to this day. So you kind of have a free experience. I'm sure you've read frequently in the newspaper information about the Common Core Standards what people support about them, and what people are curious about them, and what people don't like about them. So I thought it was important to give you an overview of the Common Core Standards, why they exist, and how we vision they'll be implemented in the district. So a disclaimer is, we are not experts. Everybody is learning together in this process. We've been very fortunate to have a few opportunities come our way, which have enabled us to be able to study the Common Core Standards before most districts have had that opportunity. So the disclaimer is that they are not implemented in our schools yet. And if you have a conversation with um, one of your children's teachers, they may say, we're just beginning to learn about them. So the expectation is not to have them implemented at this time, but to study them together and decide the best way to implement them for our very high performing districts. The assessments for the National Common Core Standards won't come into existence until 2014-2015. So it's very nice that we have breathing room and we will be including parents and other experts in our district to help us work through this really very exciting process. As you know, our belief system in District 25 is based upon Vision 2020. And when you walk into any of your children's schools or you read anything on our website, you will be able to see what our Vision 2020 stands for. It was beautifully done about five years ago. And about three years ago, we decided, how do we really make everybody aware of what Vision 2020 is all about? And so we created a framework called WIRE. And you are supposed to be able to ask your children when they come home every day how they were wired for success and understanding. And as we were preparing this presentation, all of a sudden, it hit me. The Common Core Standards are based on WIRE, and they didn't even know. So I'm going to share with you how we know that and how we interpret it. First of all, the W in Water stands for world focus. In the 21st century, it is essential that the United States compare themselves to countries around the world, not just other states in the United States. And you cannot pick up a newspaper without reading the global impact on the economy, on education, on our politics, and I could go on and on. The I in our wire stands for integration. Students frequently learn content knowledge and skills in isolation and have a very hard time integrating that knowledge and applying it to new situations. The R in our wire stands for reflection. It is essential that stakeholders, and I consider everybody in this room to be a stakeholder, to reflect on what students really need to know, to do, to understand, and to be. And I'll never forget the first time I heard that expression, what we want students to be. Well, we really want them to be global citizens who can think critically, who can collaborate around the world, and who can communicate effectively. And those are all ingredients that are part of the Common Core Standards. The E in our wire stands for engagement. Mommy, Students must engage with complex text. They need to re learn to read like detectives and write like investigative reporters. Do you ever have that one word in your whole vocabulary? That's it, investigative reporters. And the last part of our WIRE framework is discovery. Students must discover meaning through text, analyze the text, and compare it to other related texts. So I hope you can see the correlation between WIRE and the Common Core and how they really probably have our WIRE framework in mind 
when they met for four years to create the standards. One of the focuses of the Common Core Standards is preparing students for college and career readiness. There is a statistic, and I'm going to say that the statistic is thrown around because I haven't read any studies about the evidence of this, that over 50% of students, when they enter college, take at least one lower level or what they call remedial class because their skills are not proficient in one of the basic areas. And the basic area that is quoted the most is in terms of reading complex texts and be able to write um, and synthesize the information that they've learned. So these are the college and career readiness standards that have been developed in our country, and many of these are the career and college readiness skills that are used all over the world. So what are the capacities that we want a literate individual to have? They demonstrate independence and interdependence. And I truly believe that five to seven years ago, these Common Core Standards were written, we would have never had the word interdependence in that. If you remember when you went to school, many of the things you did were independent. And some of you are young enough to remember probably cooperative learning, where you work in a group, but your grade was just dependent on the work that you did. Now, in the workplace and in school, we have to teach kids to be effective collaborators and know that the success is often based upon how you work as a team member and the information that you pull together to apply to a new situation. And I see some head shaking around here for people who are probably in that very different corporate environment right now. They build strong content knowledge and can apply the knowledge to new situations. And I'm going to give you a little exercise to do in a little while. So keep that one in mind, applying the knowledge to new situations. They respond to the various demands of the audience, the task, the purpose, and the discipline. Actually, in the Common Core, they talk about formal and informal language. And there are times when you need to use formal language and informal language. And if you think back to your education, I don't remember informal language ever being an acceptable part of my education. They comprehend as well as critique. And beginning in kindergarten, the skills ask children to critique critique others, critique material that they're reading. They use technology and digital media, media strategically and capably. That is a very, very important skill. It's using technology to communicate a message or to create something new, not just to use it as a word processor. And they come to understand others' perspectives and cultures. And in this time and in our society, it is core that we understand various perspectives because much of the work that our children will be doing will be work with people in other countries. So not only do you have to understand their perspectives, but it is extremely important to understand their culture. More business deals are broken at the table for not understanding the other person's culture than they are for any other reason. So why Common Core Standards in math and English? I think that we all understand that these are the core subjects and foundations for what children need to learn. But in the Common Core Standards, especially in English language arts, much of what they're asking children to do is related to social studies and science content. And that is specifically stated so in elementary school, the teachers teach all the subjects. But in middle school, the science teacher, the social studies teacher, is going to be responsible for much of what is presented in the English language arts common core standards. It's going to cause teachers in middle school and high school to work together, to truly collaborate, so kids see the connections between what they're learning in each of the subjects. So if we have the Common Core Standards in Math and English, and the English Language Arts Standards are talking about 
social studies, and science, what are the next set of common core standards to come out? The next set of common core standards to come out are the science standards. In July of this year, the National Science Foundation and the National Research Council presented the new framework for science education in K-12 education in Washington, D.C. So our new science programs are based upon the national framework, and I'll go a little more into detail that a little later in the presentation. So how are we going to know if students are accomplishing the standards that are presented? And there are going to be national assessments. And let me give you just a little history. As you know, in around the year 2000, No Child Left Behind came in, and standardized tests were the norms against which students would be judged. However, each state determined what those standards would be. So if I was a child in Massachusetts, I would be expected to learn X, Y, and Z. And if I moved to Michigan, it might look very, very different. In Illinois, we've had the ISAT standards for a number of years. And before that, and maybe some of you remember, we had the I-GAPs. And so it was just a way. First, it was a way of measuring programs. How were programs doing? And it evolved with no child left behind to how is the individual child doing matching particular standards. Now we're going to have national standards and national assessments. So whether I'm living in Illinois, Michigan, or Massachusetts, the standards will be the same and how I will be assessed will be the same. There are two groups who are writing national standards. One is called the PARC, P-A-R-C-C group, and Illinois is part of the PARC group. The other group is Smarter Balance. Half the states have joined one consortium, and half the states have joined the other consortium. The differences between the two are not significant because they're actually based on the National Common Core Standards. The federal government gave $360 million to these two organizations <coughs> to create these standards. Right now, it looks like the park in English language arts will be assessed two times a year. All children will be assessed, and it will be a technology-based assessment. And right now, as Dawn will present the math standards, we're not sure how many times a year um, students will be assessed. But I'm sure it's going to be an evolutionary process over the next four years. And what I'm saying today might not be true a year from now or two years from now. This is an enormous, enormous task. So how are we going to know how our children are doing with these very, very rigorous and complex standards? We're going to know about it through formative assessment. And that's the ongoing assessment the teachers do with their children on a regular basis. It's that daily feedback they give them so that they can take the next step forward in accomplishing these assessments. Summative assessments are what you may know of as the end uh, unit test, the end uh, uh, particular set of skills tests, and we will have those summative assessments as well. But every time we develop a school-based summative assessment, it's going to be based upon the common core standards and what's expected of our children. And one of the beauties of this is the fact that you can create PLCs, which is a short term for professional or purposeful learning communities. It gives teachers not only in the same district and in the same state, but in the nation, an opportunity to collaborate electronically and share the very best they know about implementing the common core standards. I want you to think carefully about what tests look like when you were in school, what you were expected to do on these tests, 
And then once you get your answer, I know it's a little tight and crowded here, please put the sticky up on one of the yellow sheets of paper. So what did tests look like when you were in school? What kinds of questions did they ask you? How long did it take you to do a test? Anything you remember. It can be from elementary school, middle school, high school, college, graduate school. What do you remember about tests? You can share with your neighbor, it's absolutely fine. We collaborate around here, so it's not have to be in the center. A multiple choice in middle school uh, and high school, but no essay until college. Uh, all of them? Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, history, staying up late to memorize dates, 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 but not understanding what the events meant. Uh, coloring in the circles perfectly and being bored. Uh, the quiet of the room. ACT, SAT, essay, content based, multiple choice. Um, except for the SAT and the ACT test, they were administered by the teachers for all students in the class. Uh, low, no learning disabilities were evident in the classroom. Some essay questions, but not many. Tests were usually time period of the class, uh, 55 minutes, usually prepared by the teacher, not the state or national. Um, all tests were on paper, no study guides. I like this person, they actually did the little, like you could color in the little notes. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I shouldn't be editorializing. Um, they were not very challenging, not as often as they are today. Um, math spelling tests, tests based on memorization. Uh, in high school, a lot of multiple choice. College was emphasis on critical thinking and problem solving. Um, Got the results fairly quickly. The tests were long, hard, and boring. <laughs> Very few open-ended questions in elementary school, and the emphasis was on speed and memorization. Tests were individualized to the class and often to the teacher's individual style. Teachers had freedom, multiple choice or essay. Uh, mimeograph, the smell of the mimeograph. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Phil's still smelling it. He's going like this. Um, Jerry, did you have any that were different? Sometimes um, multiple choice short answer. Sometimes show your work, but usually based on final answer. Practical exams for skills. Verbal, verbal exams to demonstrate reasoning. Paper and pencil. Same test for all and the unit. Multiple choice with little room for error. One right answer only. Oral spelling bees <coughs> and shorts. College writing in the blue book. <laughs> Cantons. We had far fewer tests in school. More teaching to educate and less teaching to test. Scantron primarily to make it easier to score for teacher. And the number two times so many. Um, tests primarily in high school took up entire 50 minute class. Questions I don't remember any writing, very skills based. Math facts, grammar skills, reading skills, book study facts. All tests on paper, no electronic, only scan on the only space. This one, blah, blah, blah. This is the question A is blah, B is blah. So it's both A and D, and D is none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Well, I think we definitely saw a pattern in what you remember about testing. And one of the ones that were, uh, was very interesting was the fact that they never had to write an essay until they were in college. And if you remember my second slide, it talked about the fact of college and career readiness, that you don't wait to college to present those critical thinking skills and the ability to analyze information and apply it to new situations. So, now that you've all reminisced about the testing, I want to show you a question from an AP biology exam. And I just want you to read the question. And there are your answers. And please introduce yourself to the neighbor on your right and the neighbor on your left, and please select the answer. <laughs> Would anybody like to share their answer? Us, we have an answer over here. Rhizome. Rhizome. And thank you very much. Does anybody else have an answer? Roots. Roots. Friends. 
Okay, Franz. Anyone else want to take a try? Um, Mr. Robinson, our assistant principal at Dryden, former science teacher at South, could you please give us the answer? It's uh, number five, rhizomes. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, take a breath. Ready for the next question? This is a question on an AP biology test. If you'd like to read it together, that's absolutely fine. And you have four choices. And please discuss with your neighbors, who now are your best friends because you've collaborated on the first test answer, um, please select the answer. Do you all have your answer? Oh, all right. We have our answers. Who'd like to be first? One. Anyone else? We have one. All right. Fine. We'll just stick with one. Because the purpose of this exercise was not for you to come up with the right answer. The purpose of this exercise is for you to compare a question on a former AP biology exam and a question from the new AP biology exam. Because all AP tests will be changing over the next five years. And actually, one of the history AP exams, and I really can't remember which history exam it was. But there is no right answer. There is a question where you have to remember certain concepts that you learned in that history class. And then you have to use claim and evidence to support your answer. There is just not one right answer. So now back to the Common Core. But again, I wanted you to have that larger frame of reference before I go into some details about first the English language arts Common Core. So what are the elements? And I alluded to the first element before when I talked about providing equity for all students. Whether you live in a small town, a rural community, a suburban community, California, Nevada, Massachusetts, you're all going to be having the same standards, which you will be held to, and you will also be receiving the same testing. The English language arts standards include reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And in bold are what I call the pillars of the common core standards. They're what's holding every standard together. I look at them as my anchors. It's complexity of text, and claim and evidence. When students arrive at college, many of them have never experienced truly complex texts, nor have they had a lot of practice with informational reading. There's a figure down here. Starting in kindergarten, 50% of reading will be fiction, and 50% of reading will be informational text. And I'm totally embarrassed, but I thought I had changed it on the slide. It's 70-30. It's 70% informational reading in high school and 30% fiction. So think back to your careers and did you hit those numbers? So the complexity of text is important, and it's all about claim and evidence. Can students state a claim beginning in kindergarten and then give evidence to support that claim? What researchers, researchers have found about the types of questions that are asked for elementary school students and middle school and high school is many of the answers they can just figure out in their head because of background knowledge they have. They don't necessarily have to go back into the text to find evidence for the claim that they're making, which is really very interesting and causes a lot of heavy-duty discussions to be had between staff members. 
It does deal with conventions of language, when students are expected to use capitals, when they're expected to use um, punctuation and what type of punctuation at the end of the sentence. Cursive is no longer a part of the standards. Actually, this year, cursive writing was taken out of the Illinois State Standard, and all it says anywhere in the Common Core is that children need to be able to write legibly. Language talks about how they're able to use complex language, make sentences more complex, give more meaning, have more voice. Um, the standards, if you remember anything, they are fewer, clearer, and higher. There are 10 basic anchor standards in English language arts. So it's easy for anyone to remember what those standards are. Those standards don't change between kindergarten and 12th grade. Those anchor standards stay the same. It's the complexity of what we're asking students to do with the standard that changes. They're looking for text-based answers. What do you think is fine? but what you basing that evidence on. They're talking about academic vocabulary, how it's so very important for kids to have a strong understanding, not just memorize what that history word meant, which someone was talking about a few minutes ago. Obviously, all the genre of writing are going to be included, but most of the writing is going to be informative writing and argumentative writing. There will still be narrative writing done but I think it's about 20 to 30% by the time you get to high school. And applying what they have learned to new situations, it's not about memorizing, it's about understanding the concepts, understanding them deeply enough that you can apply them to new situations and create new information. And then the national standards, the national assessments. So what will be different in the English language arts standards for teachers, students, and parents? I'm an old English teacher, and I remember standing up in front of that class, presenting a piece of literature, and I told them every single thing about that piece of literature. Why I loved it, why it was selected, how it fit into history, and I think I would just ramble, ramble, ramble on. And those of you who know me know I can ramble on. But what do the kids have to do? What did they have to bring to that text? If I would have given them the first quiz, they could have answered it all by just listening to all the things that I had to say. So now, we're asking teachers to change a practice that was very, very common, and that was to give kids a lot of support and a lot of free information so that they could be successful. We're asking kids to bring critical thinking, starting in kindergarten, to the text and to pictures and to stories that they listen to aloud. And we're asking them to struggle. Many of our children in this community and in other suburban communities around the country have not had to struggle much because they come from homes with rich, literate backgrounds where parents are able to provide numerous experiences for them and all their experiences add to their background knowledge. Now they're going to have to struggle. And I think going to all of you who are parents and grandparents in the community, reporting may not look the same. Because if you think about it, if your child gets an A in language arts or an A in math, what do you know about what they've accomplished in terms of these core standards? And so that's going to be a whole paradigm shift. That's why we asked you, what was your stakeholder role in this community? Because we're all stakeholders in this process. We're all going to have to educate one another and learn. And then for students, we want them to build stamina for critical thinking, critical writing, and complex reading. And how we do that is providing opportunities in complex texts. Text for children to think critically, write critically, and to take the information that they have and apply it to new situations. And now, I'm going to turn it over to Dawn, who's going to talk about what this looks like in math. And then we are hoping
open for all of your questions, comments, concerns, etc. Good morning. Um, so, having been a math teacher, the idea of a common set of standards is very exciting to me. Um, is it perfect? No, I, you know, as we're learning, I'm sure there are things that we'll have to work through. But when students are coming from different elementary schools and different, you know, um, moving to different districts, the idea of knowing as a sixth grade teacher, this is what students should know. I can start from here and keep on going. Um, so that's that's my, I guess, my understanding of the common core for math. What should every child know and be able to do at every grade? Um, something that's exciting also with the common core is there's an earlier introduction of many ideas such as um, jumping down, like building ideas across grades. Algebra is, used to be such a scary term, the idea of going into algebra. Um, it's so mysterious, but they actually start the foundations of thinking about algebra in kindergarten. Just the idea of the unknown number. You know, what is, there's a missing number here, what's unknown number? And that's a strand that will continue all the way through um, middle school for sure. Um, Conceptual understanding as well as fluency. Uh, the other, that's another thing that's exciting to me with the math standards. That, for example, at grade um, three, every student should understand what area and perimeter is. So as a fourth grade teacher, all my students should be fluent with a model in their head. What is the, you know, what mathematical applications <coughs> can we do with this? Instead of the old standards that used to be anywhere between third and eighth grade, we can teach area and perimeter. Now it's more specific, so we know we can move on. We can, and through throughout my career teaching math, it's been amazing that I've seen area taught to students in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, same thing. You know, where they're manipulating blocks and so forth. So this is exciting that by the time they're in middle school, they can be doing. Um, quadratics, you know, higher applications of, of, of that. Um, Cross-cutting cutting mathematical practices. Um, modeling in mathematics, that is one of the eight math practices that is part of the math standards. So we have our concepts that students should learn at every grade level, and then we have these eight mathematical practices that they'll practice every grade, and then will build on itself. So in kindergarten, they'll be doing modeling with, um, you know, shapes, and then that will build. They'll still be doing modeling in first grade, and second grade, and third grade, but to more complex manners. Um, less concepts per grade, which is another, you know, it speaks to they'll have mastery at third grade on area and perimeter, and then they'll be fluent with it further on. Um, can anyone answer this question? 36. 36. Mm -hmm. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. Don't forget your units, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how did you answer that? Late and with. Right, and you knew that because? Well, I'm a middle school teacher. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a lot more in for yeah. understanding. But from my experience, I learned the formula. I didn't play around with it. I didn't discover it when I was in math class. This was the formula area. It's length times width. Memorize it, use it, move on. Um, so now, instead, is everybody up for doing a little activity? <laughs> I have some manipulatives in my, my two days. You'll have to work with a partner. And I have these <laughs> math um, tiles. They have a number on the side. We're just using the blank side. <laughs> so what are some, but share with me one rectangular garden shape that you came up with and tell me how, how you knew it was 36 square units, I guess. Like how did you organize your, your rectangular garden? Cool. A long skinny one, one by 36. That works because they use all 36 of their squares. Cool. Anybody have something different? Yeah. Six by six. Okay, six by six. Cool. So we did um, one that was 
uh, two by 15, and then another chunk that was attached to it that was two by three. So oh, it was a oh. chunk of 30 and then a chunk of 60. Okay. So it was like kind of knocked out. <laughs> well, what do you guys think of that one? Still rectangular. It's not a rectangle, has a little chunk out of it. So that would be, yeah. so what I'm getting at is in the classroom, the eight practices I mentioned, one of them is modeling. And so you're, you want students to have a chance to somehow conceptualize um, the mathematical idea you're doing. Then is there a place for it? Um, application, yes, with the formula. Then we could talk about this. Okay, they had one by 30, you know, a long garden of one by 36. Um, I saw some others, oh, six by six, I heard. And we know they're all 36 square units, and we can look at length and so forth. So um, there's a deeper understanding at each grade level, and students can walk away then in their head with the model. And then the goal is they can be presented with messy problems and be able to figure out what information do I need and how can I solve these messy problems. Um, so the, the, the first problem there, what is the area that you answered, 36 square units, used to be targeted anywhere between third and eighth, I kind of mentioned that earlier, and then assessed at fifth grade with the old math standards. Now it's targeted and assessed at grade three with the new math standards. And I have some questions. When should children learn certain concepts and show that they've mastered them? Anybody have an, a guess or an idea? Or maybe you already know? Yeah, sure. So you guys are right. Not only should they know these, but they should be able to model them. They should be able to identify where they're located in a um, picture or next to each other, beside, behind, and so forth. And so on. Um, it used to be later in elementary school with the old standards. Um, apply the distributive property to this expression. Okay, so now sixth grade, a little earlier. But again, the algebra thinking begins in early elementary and then continues on up. So as Dale mentioned earlier, um, last I heard they were planning four assessments for math a year, um, but that's not set in stone. I don't know what the, the end result will be. And it will be also electronically you know, um, administered. And it will be common to multiple states. Thank you for playing along with that. And putting the puzzle together, why we wanted all the stakeholders to be here is because we are all invested in this. Teachers, parents, community members, students, administrators, Illinois, and the entire country. And I want to talk about a few additional puzzle pieces. When I talked at the beginning about how I felt that Arlington Heights was a little more poised to adapt these standards than a few um, other communities in this area or across the nation, and it has to do with some very nice partnerships that we've developed. The first, first partnership is with Northwestern University, and that is who first published our new science program in middle school, which is called iQuest. And the author of the program, and one of the 11 authors of the new National Science Standards, actually spent the day with us and our sixth grade science teachers and eighth grade science teachers in the district. His name is Dr. Brian Reiser, and he was the one who actually introduced the new science framework to the nation in Washington, D.C., and he is a very close partner. And thanks to Dawn's partnership with him, we've actually been able to really get some deep professional learning in the area of science for our middle school. We're very excited about that. WAX is our writing program in grades 3 through 8, and one of the architects of the English Language Art Standards is also the author of this program. So much of what our children are getting right now through our WAX writing are the exact practices that the National Common Core Standards are asking us to use. And Science Companion is our new elementary science program, and that was developed by the University of Chicago, who also has an NSF grant <coughs> regarding 
um, the new national science framework, and they are working very closely with Arlington Heights. So we feel we really have had some wonderful opportunities to try out some of these concepts in the Common Core standards. And we really believe that Arlington Heights is required for success and understanding in implementing the Common Core. But it's going to be a four-year process. And we're going to all have to work very hard and wrap our arms around this new language and what we're asking teachers to do and what we're asking students to do. Although the new National Common Core Standards do not dictate how you teach, when you read these standards carefully, there is an indication of how one must teach in order to have our kids master these Common Core Standards. And before I go for questions, I just want to show you what's in your booklet. And Shannon, if I can borrow yours. We tried to put together some information that we hope at your leisure you'll want to look at and that you'll find helpful. One is the College and Career Readiness Anchor Standards for Reading. Remember I told you they were fewer, clearer, higher. There are only 10 of them, and the anchors are complexity of text and claim and evidence. In the second page are the College and Career Readiness Anchor Standards for Writing. And you can go on commoncore.standards.org and read for weeks and not get through all of the information. We also took a sample of the mathematics standards in grades three, and it goes through every single one of those areas that Dawn talked about, about the application practices. I put together some, I didn't put it together, but I'm happy to for you this about content and quality. And then if you have nothing to do when you're sharing with your neighbors about this presentation, on the last page, it gives you an example of one college and career readiness anchor standard in kindergarten through 12th grade. And the reason they combine 9 and 10 together and 11 and 12 is so high schools had the ability to teach one course in 11th grade and another course in 12th grade. So that flexibility was there. But if you look at it, you can and have this conversation with your neighbor, you will see that it is the same standard. It's only the complexity of the task that students are asked to do that's different. And the floor is yours. Whatever questions, and if we can't answer them, we will tell you so. Thank you.